My next uh, presenter is Professor Dr. Christian Perrone, world famous. And he is presenting on the antigen-based diagnostics, the value of PCR in crypto-infectious diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, it's a pleasure to have organized this meeting uh, with Jenna, Jack, uh, Fred Verlut from the Netherlands, and all the others who helped us. And uh, <clears throat> we hope that it is a start. We are not so numerous today, but it's, I think, a good beginning and to improve the scientific level in the domain of uh, what we call now the crypto infections, the hidden infections, uh, because it's not only Lyme disease, but many other diseases, as you said. So, I have been asked to speak about the PCR. Uh, I'm not a microbiologist, so some, sometimes it will be uh, <clears throat> not things I'm familiar with, but I did a review of the literature and also to present some of the data uh, we obtained from our patients with a, a vet lab because we are animals and not any other animals. So, uh, first of all, uh, in the review of the literature, a few papers about what we find in animals by PCR. I, I just looked at the recent papers because there are many, many, <coughs> some are a little old now. Uh, a paper last year uh, made in Turkey uh, on boars, hares, and foxes and their ticks. And they found uh, by PCR rickettsia from different species, Borrelia and Aplasma, and five spotted fever uh, group uh, rickettsiae. Uh, three already known as pathogenic, but also other species unknown, with unknown pathogenicity. And uh, it's interesting, but I think we, we found that also in Bartonella in humans uh, uh, several years ago in France. Uh, we can find animal species in, in, uh, in men that are not already studied. And it was funny because I was uh, reading a report of a French microbiologist attacking the vet lab who did uh, the work with me, and they said it's completely stupid to study uh, bugs that are not known in human uh, pathology. That's research, you know, you don't search what you don't know. Uh, and there was one Borrelia burgdorferi and Sulato. Uh, in Thailand now, they, they studied rodents, ectoparasites, and uh, humans. Uh, large amounts of them, and the patients were with uh, undifferentiated febrile illness. Uh, in the Nan province, uh, it's a highly endemic uh, place for scrub typhus due to Orientia tutsugamushi. Uh, so they use a 16S RNA gene amplified and sequenced with Illumina, uh, real-time PCR and Sanga sequencing, and in patients, with uh, UFI, rodents and parasites, they, they found a lot of bugs, Bartonella, Rickettsia, Leptospira, Orion, Satsusugamushi. They found them in chiggers, it could be a, a vector, and a plasma. And uh, it's interesting, they find an aplasma in the animals, but it was not already known in, in humans in this region. And in rodents and parasites, they found Neoerlichia, Mikuransis, and Neorickettsia and Borrelia. Uh, now in Sweden, they look at the Eurasian moose. Uh, maybe it's different from the moose in Canada, I don't know. But. Uh, so they, they look at the spleen, and the vectors are the cats. I don't know this kind of vector. I looked in the literature, it's a kind of lice. Uh, and with high throughput PCR for 24 bacteria and 12 pathogenic parasites, they found a uh, a real big uh, proportion of uh, anaplasma, more than 80%, and then Borrelia, Babesia, and Bartonella. Now in Slovakia, they looked at wild ungulates, uh, and some are positive for anaplasma, thelaria, and mixed infection. And I think we should look more now at thelaria in humans, because um, if you looked at the publications about this bug, it's a parasite, it's a cousin of Babesia, belonging to the pyroplasmosis group. And uh, there is a publication in France, but maybe from other teams, showing that if you put Theraria on human cells, uh, it's uh, oncogenic. Maybe it could have a role in some uh, cancers. But it's not a uh, search in humans yet, but uh, we could start to find some in humans if we look at it. Uh, rodents in Slovenia, they found Borrelia in the lungs, and. 
22% of Borrelia afzelii in heart specimen. Um, and they compared the light mix uh, technique with an in-house uh, nested PCR. And you see that you can ha have uh, big differences between different techniques. As the problem with PCR, we have many techniques with different results. And the rare cases of Borrelia miyamotoi. So now, uh, look about what was found in humans, and after I will speak about the techniques. Uh, here from skin biopsies, uh, studies looking at PCR in erythema migrans cases. Uh, the first one, it was in Poland, 86 patients, and they, <clears throat> you can see that even you treat the erythema migrans uh, with uh, antibiotics, you can find uh, positive PCR. Uh, Stupica in Austria, 121 patients. Uh, PCR was positive in 78% of the cases. You can see that it's more uh, sensitive uh, than culture. Uh, and most of the cases were absolutely high. Uh, and they could see that the higher the bacterial load, the, the lower the response to treatment. And after that, the there are other publications about uh, some rare diseases where uh, borrelia can be found by PCR, so flagell disease, granuloma annulare, and morphea. And now about Lyme neuroborreliosis. Uh, here you have a, a study in Norway uh, on 58 children, and they, you know, it has been already published, but the. Uh, the intrathecal and index of uh, specific antibodies is not, could be a good method, but uh, sensitivity is insufficient. So they perform real-time PCR and CSF <coughs> with uh, the Borrelia bogdorferi sansulato PCR. And if the test was positive, then they, they perform the five single plex for genotype determinations. So 88, no, 58 children with uh, neuroborreliosis and uh, 28 controls, and they found a sensitivity of 46%. So it's not perfect, it's not too bad, but it's a, uh, specificity was very good, and most of the cases were due to Borrelia garinii. And uh, there is a review uh, by Rudzik Sablicic in uh, 2016. I will speak more about this review later, but here about Lyme neuroborreliosis, looking at what was published, they said it's around uh, the median sensitivity is around 22%. Uh, here you have a study uh, comparing free real-time PCR kits, Islam neuroborreliosis, um, O-Diaborber kit, Isex, and the real TM SAC. I don't know, uh, I'm not a specialist of the machines. Uh, kits were analyzed on Rotor Gene Q, CFX96, and Light Cycler 480. They found a good reproductibility for all the assays, no cross-reactivity. Uh, the DIA method failed to detect Borrelia lusitanae, so there is a problem with some species. Uh, better overall performance of the gen kit on RGQ. Uh, however, for failure of PCR in this study uh, to detect uh, Borrelia from uh, clinical samples in the CSF. And another uh, study published in 2018, um, they tried to see if they could improve the results of PCR, either by uh, taking larger samples of CSF, not one liter, but uh, more milliliters of uh, CSF, and faster handling, not a sample wait 24 hours or somewhere before arriving in the lab. But when you do that, you have a trend toward better results, but uh, unfortunately, it's not significant. Uh, in synovial fluid, it's uh, probably the, the best results uh, in Lyme disease. Uh, in cases of Lyme arthritis, uh, PCR is more sensitive than culture. And uh, it, here it's a median of different publications. In the US, it's 85% uh, sensitivity. In Europe, 72%. Uh, about persistent board infection, here you have the recent paper published by Middelvin with uh, Eva Shapi. Uh, the methodology is good, but unfortunately, the 
<clears throat> the patient sample is rather low. They studied on 12 patients. Uh, they said randomly selected. Uh, they were already treated uh, either before, some were still under treatment at the time of the uh, sample and controls. Uh, they compared uh, different methods, uh, the microscope, histopathology, molecular testing culture, and the PCR were realized in two different labs. The samples were blinded, controls or not, uh, plus gene sequencing. And a third lab was uh, involved only for two patients for the genital secretion. And if you look at the results, the culture was positive in all the cases. That's not usual, but in this study, it was 12 out of 12. For PCR, the blood was positive uh, 7 out of 12. Genital secretion, 10 out of 12, and skin, 2 out of 12. And if you compare the three labs, uh, the lab one was, uh, has the highest performance. Uh, lab two, it was a, a little uh, less rate of detection, and the lab three, but only on two patients. Uh, they found much less bugs in the genital secretion than the other labs. So the methodology is interesting, but I think we cannot conclude on this paper because samples are too, too small. It should be done on a wider range. And now, different techniques of PCR in the literature. Uh, some looked at how to, to improve the method by increasing the number of targets. So here's a paper from the Netherlands by Deleuve. Uh, using Borea bogdorferi sensulato. Uh, they say that the most frequently used PCR are the plasmid-encoded outer surface protein A gene, the OSP-A target. Uh, but OSP-A uh, PCR doesn't detect Lusitanie and uh, Miyamoto. So you have to make choices. And the risk of false negatives uh, exists with this method because you can lose the plasmids. Uh, so they look at the DNA multiplex qPCR. The, the, this technique uses the same OSP a target, but uh, in addition to two extra target genes, chromosomal 5S, 23S, RNA intergenic space on flagellin B, and it increases sensitivity on CSF samples, but uh, you see it's, um, the rate is low, 15%. Uh, nested PCR. Uh, here they compared the universal loop mediated isothermal amplification primers targeting the FLAD gene from the flagellin of Borrelia bogdorferi sensulato, and they compared with nested PCR on uh, more than 100 human sera. The rate was similar in the, with both methods, but if you combine both methods, you have better results. It's more sensitive. Uh, here you have improved real-time PCR, a study from Poland on more than 500 people. Most of them were woodworkers. Uh, if you see the PCR uh, posit positivity was low uh, in the blood, 3% only. And here you have the percentage of uh, serology, around one-third of the patients positive by serology. But we have no information about the clinical conditions of his uh, forest workers. The Tachman real PCR, real-time PCR, <clears throat> here you have uh, two techniques, a uh, duplex real-time PCR targeting Flay B of uh, Borrelia bogdorferi and Sulato, and they use an internal control, and they could see a high uh, sensitivity and specificity, isolation of 20 gen genome equivalents, uh, and they compared with the tetraplex, uh, looking at Avzelii, Garinii, Bogdorferi, and Lusitanie. Uh, it provided uh, also a high specificity, but a lower sensitivity. So you have to choose sometimes with the techniques looking at many different strains. Uh, they can lose in sensitivity or to concentrate on one strain, but you don't look at the others. And so it's uh, difficult to conclude about all that. Uh, here is a review I told you about. Uh, they looked at different uh, aspects in the literature. Uh, first of all, you have to eliminate uh, human DNA when you have the sample because 
there, are, there is an overwhelming ratio of human to microbial DNA. How you eliminate uh, human DNA without eliminating the bacterial DNA? So in the commercial kits, we have different techniques for enrichment in uh, microbial DNA. So the Morise's basic five kit, uh, it lyses human cells and degrades release DNA. Another one, the uh, NEBN uh, next, separates vertebrate from microbial DNA and the pure proof uh, DNA binding protein is recognized recognizing motif predominant in bacterial genome. So they compared that, and they concluded that uh, Molises uh, uh, could obtain the complete elimination of human DNA, but also uh, could decrease uh, the quantity of bacterial DNA. And they compared also automatic and manual extraction, and it was similar. Uh, so it's like the... Cook, cook recipes, you know, <laughs> they are looking at many factors. Uh, now they looked at uh, how to select the appropriate target. Uh, to have a good target, you have to select an appropriate one to be amplified. Uh, it must be genetically stable. Uh, it should enable detection of all the species of Borrelia, Bogdorferis, and Sulato complex. Uh, most of the commercial Kids use a 16S RNA gene with OSP A, FLA, and uh, REC A. Uh, and they are mostly qualitative real time PCR assays. Uh, FLA is a low discriminatory, has a low discriminatory power between species. And OSP A, OSP B, and OSP C uh, are located on plasmids, so they are highly variable. And uh, as it may vary, the amplification may not occur for some species. So we looked at how to improve uh, <clears throat> the role of the number, of the signif signification of the number of bacteria amplified, the pitfalls. Uh, as I told you previously, to improve sensitivity, you can increase the number of targets up to eight. Um, there is a study by HU in 2012 showing that in early Lyme disease, there was 62% sensitivity in blood, and also I spoke about this Dutch study by Deleuve before. Uh, classical nested PCR, <clears throat> higher sensitivity and specificity than the standard PCR. And for clinical uh, samples, uh, uh, if uh, it's a larger number of Borrelia is associated with severity of signs and symptoms and with a positive culture. So the pitfalls are well known for the specialist. Uh, you have inhibitors of PCR, either natural in plasma, CSF skin, but also lab products may, may act as inhibitors. Uh, for example, heparin, formalin. You have, to, of course, a problem of contamination and there's a need for internal control. Uh, look, here you have the study done by Igenex, of It's a firm study uh, published by Dr. Shah. Uh, Lyme multiplex PCR dot blot assay on the whole blood, serum, and urine. Uh, patients had suspected Lyme disease, but uh, the clinical condition is not detailed in the paper, so that we don't know exactly the kind of patients. Uh, control its DNA from other bacteria and parasites. Uh, it's in vitro controls uh, on DNA from other bacteria and parasites. Uh, this study is a little bit heterogeneous because they had a cohort of patients from Texas and a cohort of patients who had sent a, a specimen to Palo Alto in California directly to IGNX. But the population do not seem to be uh, similar. Uh, this technique is highly specific for Borrelia bogdorferi, but we have uh, different results uh, in both cohorts. In Texas, 21% of seronegative samples are PCR positive, and they use the CDC recommended uh, serology. And in IGNX, uh, what is they presented the results in the other way, so it's uh, difficult to compare. I don't know why, but uh, 20. 28% of PCR positive samples are CDC's uh, Western blood positive. And when they use their own IGNX serology, which is more sensitive, uh, it's 58% uh, of PCR positive samples uh, which are IGNX Western blood positive. And uh, 
Uh, in this paper, they underline the, the interest of uh, urine detection uh, compared to blood. Uh, and here you have another study. Uh, it's interesting because they compared different labs. It was conducted in Scandinavia. So Sweden, Norway, Denmark, they compared uh, five, eight methods in five different labs with blinded samples. Uh, so <clears throat> the first uh, kind of sample was cDNA in water, which was extracted for cultured, <coughs> from cultured Borrelia. The other one was cultured Borrelia in CSF, and the third one, DNA dilutions from cultured Borrelia bogdorferi, and also relapsing fever Borrelia. And they found a high level of concordance, especially between techniques with using the uh, 16S RNA as a target gene. Uh, and the concordance was linked to the cDNA as a type of template. Uh, they found a sensitivity higher with DNA than cDNA. And they found also that some techniques were not able to detect Borrelia Spielman, Spielmannia, Lusitania, Japonica. Uh, a paper about uh, nested real-time PCR on uh, nearly 100 samples from uh, suspected Lyme disease. They looked also at the gradient of temperature, the gradient of magnesium. Uh, you can see that the nested PCR is much better, nearly 50% of positive results, compared with only 2% if you don't uh, do the pre-amplification. And here you have the level of zero positivity. Uh, a word about the nanotrap, it's a, a technology uh, that is used in uh, the US now, but it's only a stu really studied in early phase of Lyme disease at the stage of the erythema migrants. Uh, maybe there are other studies done on chronic patients, but they are not published yet, so I, I didn't find any information in the literature. Uh, so the nanotrap particles concentrate the urinary OSP A, uh, they use a highly specific anti-OSP-A monoclonal antibody as a detector. Uh, they looked, they checked that there are no uh, homology to human proteins, no cross-reactivity with non uh, boreal bacterial proteins. They did that of 268 urine samples. And uh, if people have FMA migrants, you see it's 100% positive, and they compared with controls without EM, it was negative. Uh, they also could see that if you, the antrima migrants persist, the elimination of OSP A in urine persists. Uh, there's a good correlation between the resolution of signs after treatment and cessation of OSP A urinary shedding. You could tell me that it's uh, as rapid to look at the EM and to see if it's still there or not, but it's interesting on a scientific point of view. Um, so in July 2018, because uh, the file has been uh, given to the FDA and uh, they, they recognize this uh, dossier as breakthrough device designation, but it's an ongoing process before approval only for the early stage. Because I saw a, a paper made by an American physician, I don't remember who, a clinician, who said, oh, now uh, uh, nanotrap is used for chronic Lyme, it works. But I didn't find the publication, so I, I'm cautious at the present time. But maybe my American colleagues know more about it. Uh, now I'll speak about Borya Miyamoto. Uh, here's a famous study by Shin Kang Lee uh, from the United States uh, a few years ago. He used a highly conserved uh, segment of 16S RDNA gene of Borya Bogdorferis and Sulato and another segment from Miyamoto. And the amplicons were used as templates for direct Sanger DNA sequencing. Uh, it was done in winter, but even in winter, he found spirochetemia uh, in 14 patients, including four Miyamoto and one combination of Miyamoto and Bordorferi. In another study, uh, using multiplex real time PCI in New York, New York State, uh, nearly 800 clinical specimen blood uh, and CSF. Uh, here they found uh, a few cases of Miyamoto, only eight, but much more anaplasma, and early share, a little bit of early share also. Uh, here I would like to present the, the results of the study we conducted recently in France with uh, 
I worked with Professor uh, Michel Franck here. He's a, he was professor of vet uh, medicine in, at the University of Lyon. He's retired, but like uh, Michael, he's never stopping working, and he created a private lab to continue his research, and with different uh, uh, researchers. Uh, Rauf Gossitz, the president of our federations against uh, uh, Lyme disease, and uh, Hugues Gascon, who is also a very good immunologist doing research. Uh, here, just a brief summary about Miyamoto. It was found before in rodents in Japan. In, Japan. Uh, in 2013, it was found from patients. Also after that in Belgium, England. But in France, they said, no, no Miyamoto. We have the border. Uh, but it was isolated a few years ago in ticks, in rodents. No, in Strasbourg, the National Reference Center. No Miyamoto in humans. We are here. We are, we are the, the watch. Uh, but it was never... So if you don't search something, you know that you don't... You don't uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, it's a primary principle for researchers. Uh, there is... A, uh, Nice study in, uh, conducted in Russia, published last year, uh, but it was done at the emergency ward of a hospital uh, when somebody came after a tick bite with an acute uh, symptomatology with a fever, headache, uh, pain, and so on. Uh, they, they tested them by PCR, and they found the, the Borea Miyamoto in 70, 70 out of 473 patients. So for our patients, they were chronic patients. Uh, with, uh, in France, we don't like PTLDS, but we say SPPT. In French, it's a, a persistent polymorphic syndrome, possibly due to a tick bite. Uh, it can be anything, you know. Uh, with uh, controlled students. Uh, we use a sequence, uh, 94 uh, base pairs located on the GLPQ gene. Uh, and using a, a kit specific of Miyamoto uh, avoids the loss of sensitivity common with multiplex kits. Uh, and uh, there was a sequencing of, of some amplification products randomly chosen to confirm the specificity of the amplification. And here, the healthy controls are all negative. Uh, on the 824 patients tested, 5% were positive for Borea Miyamoto. Uh, and of the 43 positive samples, 21 could be amplified, and the 20, so it's a half, and the other half was just below the limit uh, of quantif quantification. Uh, I was interested to, to have a look at the clinical condition of this patient. I'm a clinician. Uh, it's Borea Miyamoto have never been described in France previously. It was not planned when we did the bacteriological study, but after that, we sent a standardized questionnaire to the patients and their physician if they, are, uh, if they agreed to respond. And 31 out of the 43 patients responded. So you see that uh, six patients were ill for less than one year, but many were ill for many years, some for 20 or 30 years. Uh, the ELISA for uh, Bordaferi the standard, standard serology for Lyme, uh, was negative in uh, three quarters of the cases, the Western blot in half of the cases. Uh, memory of a tick bite, half of the patients, so it's like Lyme. Uh, EM previously observed by the patient, 16%, so it's a low rate. <clears throat> and we don't know in these cases if uh, this previous EM was due to Borrelia Miyamoto or to a previous Borrelia Bogdorferi and Sulato infection. Just to compare with a Russian study, but it's a different context, it's uh, early disease. In the Russian study, they found only 3% of the patients with uh, erythema migrans, and we found 16%. So uh, that confirms that probably uh, Borrelia Miyamoto infection doesn't give many uh, erythema migrans uh, uh, pictures. Uh, clinical presentation, I will go very briefly to just to show you that all the patients had asthenia, joint pain, neurocognitive disorders, 80% myalgia, and 64% uh, high-level cephalalgia. 
sleeping disorders in all, and uh, half of them had chest tightness, lack of air, so respiratory symptoms, and others common with the P classical PTRDS syndrome. And what is interesting, it, uh, because you know that Borrelia burgdorferi belongs to the relapsing fever group, and uh, so we asked people about fever and uh, related conditions, and one third said they had episode of relapsing fever, uh, no fever in the majority of the cases, chilliness, 58%, hot flushes, more than the half, and sweats, uh, nearly half of the patients. So this kind of thermic disorder seems to be common in the Borrelia Miyamoto infections. Uh, so in conclusion, it was found in 5% of the patients with PTLDS. Uh, so it's the largest series at this stage of chronic disease. Uh, majority uh, negative for Lyme serology, asthenia, pain, neurocognitive, and sleep disorders in 100% of the cases, and relapsing fever, 35%. Uh, so there is a large uh, Russian study in early cases. So I think uh, it would be important to, to work together to put in place a larger study in Europe with well-defined populations to, to better analyze these cases. Uh, now I would present briefly uh, another study we conducted on PTLDS patients comparing di different matrices and we compared um, uh, these patients were not treated for, for at least two months before the, the study. Uh, PCR was done with two samples from each matrix at day zero or day two and the four matrices were venous blood, urine and saliva and at the half of the study, we added for the, for the patients uh, capillary blood uh, collected by a needle puncture at the tip of the finger. Because you know that capillary blood sometimes is more ri richer in uh, some bacteria than venous blood. Uh, here's the results of more than 100 patients. Uh, <clears throat> so 71, they have three matrices and the uh, 30, 34 patients have the four matrices. Um, here you have the percentage of positivity, at least for one of the two detections. And you can see that in uh, venous blood, 17% of posi positive is for any bug. It can be Borrelia or uh, Ehrlichia or Babesia. Uh, urine, high level of detection of at least one bug, nearly half of the patients. Uh, saliva, high rate, but we don't know in saliva if it's only colonization or it's not so strong than the blood or even urine. And capillary blood, uh, we have less patients, but it seems interesting for some uh, bugs. Uh, just briefly for Ehrlichia, we can find Ehrlichia in all the matrices, so uh, we don't know if really there is one matrix better than the others. For rickettsia, there is a high level of carriage in saliva and infection in urine. Uh, it doesn't appear a clear superiority of the capillary blood, so it could be interesting for rickettsia. But we don't know in saliva if it's a active secretion by the salivary glands, like in animals where the, the bug is coming from the inside and come in saliva through the glands to be inoculated to another animal, for example or it's just a, a symptomatic carriage coming from the outside. So that should be studied further. Uh, mycoplasma, interesting, uh, interestingly, we see high level of carriage in saliva and infection in urine, but the same thing in saliva, we don't know if it's uh, uh, relevant or not. Uh, but here, it seems there is really a superiority of the capillary blood because there were less patients and we found more in this uh, matrix. Matrix. Uh, Candida, I didn't believe before at the responsibility of Candida albicans in some uh, conditions because the Lyme doctors said always, yes, this patient has Candida. But so we, we looked at it and we, we found Candida specimens in some patients, uh, capillary, especially in capillary blood. In saliva, I don't believe in the relevance because it may be uh, just uh, carriage. Uh, and in urine also, it's difficult to distinguish with real infection and contamination where, when you collect the urine. For Coxella uh, we found it uh, 
especially in the blood. And Bartonella, uh, high rate of positivity in uh, urine. So, um, and here for Bo our Borrelia in this study, uh, we didn't find uh, very low levels of Borrelia, uh, no in the blood, and, uh, but the, the total amount of patients was much lower than in the previous study, but uh, we are a little uh, disappointed, but we found in one in saliva and uh, two in urine. And Babesia, uh, clearly the combined venous blood and capillary blood uh, should be important. Uh, and the advantage to do a double sample, uh, here you have the percentage where if you had, we had, we had uh, done only one detection, we could have uh, lost 15% of the patient, 28%, 15% or 30%. Maybe it's like uh, when you search for uh, uh, tubercle bacilli in the smears, uh, in the in the sputum, uh, we do it uh, two or three times. Uh, and to finish a single score genome sequencing by, uh, uh, it has been presented just before, but by Singh Hangley and uh, Jack Lambert. Uh, it was just published uh, recently. Um, they use a core genome which corresponds common to all isolates of Borrelia. It's a highly conserved genome-specific segment of the 16S RNA gene. And they look at that for Borrelia bogloferis and Sulato, but also for uh, relapsing fever Borrelia. Uh, and they compare them to the Borrelia DNA sequences you find in the gene bank. Um, and they use the 21 base PCR primer sites, and they choose them to be different from the sequences uh, from common blood borne pathogens. And they looked at the accessory genome, which is specific of a uh, species. And the PCR applicants were used as templates for single sequencing for routine species differentiation. Uh, they used venous blood, blind coded serum samples from the CDC, positive or negative, and also in gold sticks. And, uh, so Xing Hang Li said uh, there is no need of expensive software or bioinformatic expertise that is needed for the next generation sequencing and any uh, routine lab could do this kind of job. So just to finish about deniers, because it's, uh, I like to see that. Uh, during years, the CDC, the IDA says uh, PCR, double bullshit, all false positive. They said, uh, you know, the foci DNA, amber DNA, it's a dead bacteria. That's impossible in science. Uh, new DNA is destroyed by the DNA in, in mammals. So uh, after that, they said, you remember an editorial published two years ago, oh, uh, positive PCR is only bad labs that don't work properly, and uh, P probably Borrelia come, DNA come from the tap water. I don't know a single uh, lab uh, working with tap water, and, and Borrelia are not, are not contaminant of water. And now, the IDSA published a paper in uh, September 2018 saying, oh, uh, serology is not so nice, but we couldn't, we couldn't uh, know that before. But PCR could be interesting for research. And, uh, and, and uh, last month, the French National Reference Center for Borreliosis and the lab of Didier Raoult in uh, Marseille, who is now, after Willy Bogdorfer, the World WHO Reference Center for Rickettsiosis, they publish this paper. And here you have sentences from the abstract. They say, all currently available diagnostic tools are imperfect. The same authors wrote in the same journal one month before, the serology are perfect. <laughs> OK. Uh, I think they are infected and uh, memory problems, it's not possible. Uh, Real-time PCR now plays an important role in direct diagnosis. The same said before, including in front of the Academy of Medicine, that uh, PCR was a very bad technique, that they were all uh, false, ne uh, false positive. And then, the last sentence of the abstract, uh, so, uh, in addition to the biological results, physicians should always take into consideration the clinical and epidemiological context. So, 
I say that for years, you also. <laughs> but I, so I cited this article in a recent editorial in Le Point Weekly uh, magazine in France. I congratulated Professor Jolac, the director of the National Reference Center, to recognize that uh, there was no test perfect. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, it's, a <coughs> it's a little bit messy when you look at all these publications because you have various techniques, often homemade, various results, various matrices, uh, frequent low sensitivity. <coughs> uh, we really need a comparative studies, standardization, collaboration between human labs and vet labs uh, to organize that in networks to compare techniques. Uh, it's a major problem in many countries. Uh, major labs and reference centers don't work, don't want to work on Borrelia and uh, co-infection because they say it doesn't exist. So if we could uh, together uh, create a new networks, comparison of patient of techniques, uh, it would be uh, very powerful, I think, to improve these techniques. So thank you. Don't ask me two technical questions, uh, just a clinician. <laughs> Very quick questions. Um, whole blood, serum, and the urine, which one is better in terms of Between PCR? Serum and whole blood, uh, here we compared only whole blood and uh, capillary blood. Uh, I, I didn't say comparison between serum and whole blood, sorry, but... So is, is, is a urine, like, a, um, usable? I don't know, I can't find a word to describe it. Is, is a urine good enough in terms of PCR detection? Because as far as I know, urine is not really a good song pole in terms of to get DNA out of it. Uh, uh, the, the vets say the contrary. They say that in animals they... We made a lot of diagnosis with urine, uh, so it, it's not a habit in humans, but I think that all these results should be confirmed comparing to the clinical condition. And, uh, uh, if you select a uh, hundred of urines, you don't know if the patients are healthy, uh, people are healthy or have a lot of symptoms, we, we have to work on that. Uh, and we don't know exactly, but I think Urine, except for, for example, candidiasis, because if, uh, especially women, if uh, they are collecting their urine, you can have a little bit of candida in the vagina and contaminate it in the tube. But uh, I, I'm not sure that coxella, vernetia, or, or rickettsia are ex external contamination. I think if they are present in urine, it's coming from the body. But we should confirm that, of course. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, in referring then to your own study, um, you said that there was quite a lot of um, PCR positive miyamatoi cases and they were serology negative for Lyme. And yes. I was wondering what A serology, serology for Bordeauxferi. Uh, but what Sensor serology did you do? Hmm? What, what kind of serology did you do? It's a uh, Borrelia miyamatoi, Sansulato, uh, serology of the National Reference Center. But Eliza, Western blot? Eliza and Western blot, yes. Both. And well, I, I, the detail was on the slide, but I, I, I went rapidly, not to, to be too long, but uh, if you, you'll have the slide afterwards, you have all the details of positive cases in Eliza, Western blot, or, or in some cases, the information was not obtained because we asked the results of the serology retrospectively to the patient to send a copy of the serology. And sometimes some patients didn't answer. Okay. Uh, um, maybe, I don't know if you've heard that uh, uh, it has been uh, presented also in uh, at the Atlanta Congress uh, last year that uh, actually uh, for specifically Borrelia miyamatoi, uh, they usually quite highly positive, for instance, in the C6 ELISA, but they are uh, mm. blood negative. But we we blood didn't negative. do the C6 ELISA, so I cannot tell you about these patients. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, because sometimes uh, our National Reference Center says, don't worry about other species other than the free, free principle, uh, Bordorferi sensu stricto, Avzelia, Garinia. They say, including in the media, our test is so perfect that it detects all the species of Borgia in the world. So uh, they, they, people in the IDAC also say, uh, no, don't worry about Miyamoto, uh, they, they should be detected by serology. That shows that it's not the case, and most of the cases are negative for the usual serology. <clears throat> you you tell about uh, nano trap nano trap is te uh, technique. Uh, would it be uh, available in, in Europe? Uh, not yet because it's not yet officially registered. I know that it's in the FDA process now. Uh, maybe uh, the American colleagues could say more about it. No. Yes. But, uh, but I'm conscious because I know that some uh, American clinicians who have access to the test use it for chronic patients, but I didn't see the studies, so... I can address the question about the nanotrap. There, the company is very open to using it in research arrangements and are willing to fund those studies if you say nice things to them. Mm. So it could be used. Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, as for some scientists, a, P a positive PCR doesn't mean that the bacteria is still alive. Um, what's about uh, reverse transcription PCR? Uh, I didn't see papers about that. No. Yeah. But, uh, so what about the reverse transcription PCR? I, I didn't see uh, papers published on ah, with Okay. Mm. Okay. Thank you. My question. Just my question is about the core genome that yes. is supposed to be linking uh, Lyme, Lyme borreliosis and relapsing fever borreliosis mm. in the PCR testing. I just was wondering uh, anything you might want to say about the core genome because there's been discussion about the need to find a core genome, and my understanding is that Sin Hang Lee has found it and he used it for part of his um, PCR testing well, approach. He says that there are core genomes common to different species and uh, accessory genomes specific of one species, but uh, uh, there are not all the details in the paper. But okay. I, I mean, that study was actually done in ticks, you know, so you can actually take the ticks, grind them up, and then do PCR, and, and yes, they were able to find a kind of a core genome, but, but that the challenge for, for Sin Lee and, and, and everyone else is that, is that if you've got relapsing fever, borreliosis, you've got high spirochotemia. It's easy to diagnose by PCR, but with, with some of the other borrelia species, including the ones that the Irish are in, in, in infected with, you know, the, the, the Grinii, um, you, you've got 14 copies, very small copy number in humans. And then if you don't catch them in the state of a, their acute infection, they're, they're negative by PCR. So, 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 I agree. so this the study that, that we did in Ireland is on ticks. It's easy to grind up the ticks and do the PCR. It's difficult to grind up the people and do the PCR. Um, so, so we obviously need, need, need diagnos diagnostics are much more sensitive. I mean, the other thing that Sam picks up is that you'll have intermittent bouts of, of spirochotemia up and down and up and down and up and down, and it's, 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 it's catching, catching that, and sometimes the spirochetes are only cell-associated. So, so this is, I think this is the huge challenge. We, we need to get to be, I think, we need to get rid of ant immunological tests, which are indirect tests, because people always argue, you know, you know your test is 50% sensitive, 60% sensitive, is sometimes positive, sometimes negative, you know, depending upon the immune system. But an antigen-based te based test is 100%, but only if you get enough antigen to detect. So, so I think there is a, there is a core sequence that SINs identified, and I think if we could refine that technique to identify most of the strains of Borrelia, that would be that would that's the gold standard. That is the you know, but but I don't think we have the technology to do that yet.